Wednesday, June 18th. Clerk, will you please call the roll? Call in the roll, Ms. Brown. Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. We have a quorum. All right. Is there any public comment? No, no one is signed in. All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from the June 4th meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All right. It's been moved and second. If there are no questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right. We're going to go a little bit out of order. So if you will read the... Um, matter of fact, we'll, 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 we'll actually go in order. Um, if you'll read the first item into the record. Resolution number 2019-0135. Confirming the county executive's appointment of Anthony G. Tavro to serve on the Cuyahoga County Community Improvement Corporation Board of Trustees for an unexpired term ending 1-1-2022. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Pomerantz. If you will speak to uh, this uh, request. Uh, yes, um, Madam Chair. Um, Anthony Tavro is being um, considered by the executive for a three-year term. Unfortunately, Anthony could not be here today, so the, um, I'm requesting us to put a delay on this until Anthony is available to come to address the body. I will request him to consider coming on Tuesday or at the next um, committee meeting. All right, thank you very much. So we will, um, I will yield to Councilman Miller, given this information and you being one of our experts as far as rules go, should we table this matter or do we move it on to... Moving on to our full council. I think you should just hold it in committee. Okay. All right. I will um, follow our uh, senior council members' uh, instructions and hold this in committee um, and move on to our next item, which is item B. Council clerk, will you please uh, read the next item into the record? Resolution number 2019-0136, confirming the county executive's appointment or reappointment of various individuals to serve on the City of Cleveland, Cuyahoga County Workforce Development Board for various terms. All right, thank you very much. And it looks like our first candidate will be Harriet Applegate, but I'll turn it back over to uh, Ms. Pomerant. So if you'll give us a little bit of information with regards to this appointment. Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, um, the county um, executive is excited to consider the appointment of Harriet Applegate for the labor organization requirement on the Cleveland Cuyahoga County Workforce Development Board. Um, Harriet would be, um, they've considered, would be filling an unexpired three-year term, which would end June 30th, 2020, and be replacing Dave Wondolowski, who had previously served in the labor portion for the Workforce Development Board. Harriet is a head of AFL-CIO, a long, well-renowned um, um, labor uh, official, and it's somebody that we think would be a wonderful asset to the Workforce Development Board. Thank you very much. Are there term limits with regards to the composition? Uh, Madam Chair, there are three-year terms, but they are not, they are, um, uh, they are evergreen, meaning that they can be reappointed. Um, so Harriet would be filling the um, seat that Dave Wondolowski previously had. Okay, and it looks like this will be for a, um, not for the full three-year term. So Mr. Wondolowski has vacated the seat or? Yes, he has. Okay. And can you give us the composition, the current composition of the uh, Workforce Development Board? Sure. Um, currently, we have, this is a long one, um, Vocational Rehabilitation, Camille Ali. We also have for reappointment consideration, Ted Carter. Higher Ed's um, representation, William Gary, Pam Jankowski, William Moore. Those are from the Cuyahoga County Library and ODJFS. Then 20% is required for workforce. Um, Three of these are joint, two city, county, and two city. So for the government, um, the city one is David Ebersall. The county from TANF is David Merriman. The labor organization for this one is Dan O'Malley. The joint labor apprenticeship is Jason Shank. Felton Thomas Jr. from the Cleveland Public Library. Deb Vesey from Deaconess Foundation. And then this other portion would be the position um, to be filled um, by uh, Miss Applegate. Then the other county appointments include 
Grace Gallucci from Noaka, Aaron Grossman from, oh, excuse me, not Aaron Grossman, he's no longer on, Michael Jeans from Growth Opportunity um, Partners, potentially Ethan Karp, who's here today, Shauna Marbury from Greater Cleveland Partnership, C.J. Matthews from Mount Sinai Ministries, Kim Shelnick from University Hospitals, Latoya Smith from Fifth Third, Sheila Wright from Forest City Realty Trust. And then the rest, the other nine, are all city appointments, and I can read that list. Uh, Marzell Brown from Rockwell Automatic, Gabriel Bruno from Lincoln Electric, Senyat Faduku from Shogo, Margie Judd from Executive Arrangements Incorporated, Joshua Perkins McCam from McTech, Kim Thomas from Christopher Amira Studios, Mickey Tubbs from Fit Technologies, David Turner, First Energy, and James Vaughn III from JGD Incorporated. Sounds like an extensive uh, board. And how often do they meet? Hmm. I am not positive on that. Quar quarterly, quarterly meetings. All right. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. If, are there any other questions from the from my colleagues for Ms. Pomerant? Okay, there being none, Ms. Applegate, if you'll please step forward, give us a little bit of your background and why you would like to serve on this board. Sorry. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, currently the Executive Secretary of the North Shore AFL-CIO. I've been in this job for 12 years. Previous to that, I was a uh, national representative for the National AFL-CIO. Um, and then I've been, uh, before that, I've been involved in labor and actually uh, workforce development almost my entire career. Um, this is, uh, I previously served on the workforce board and and went off. Uh, and um, I'd, I'm pleased to, to return if you guys so see fit. Um, I'm very interested in workforce development and economic development. And I think it's really, uh, I think unions have a very important role to play in that because as I think everybody is excruciatingly aware, lots of people who work are poor. So the answer uh, is not jobs and more jobs. The answer is good jobs and sustainable jobs. And unions are the best way, the quickest way, and, and the, the most uh, assured way of lifting people out of poverty and bringing them into the middle class because when you're in a union, you have health benefits and pension. Even if you don't, as the janitors in Cleveland, they don't make a lot of money, but they have, they have protection on the job, they have benefits, and they have pensions. It makes a world of difference, even for low-wage workers. So I think it's really important to have a voice on the Workforce Development Board for not just jobs, jobs, more jobs, and not just pathways, pathways, and more pathways, but actual putting people into good, sustainable jobs where they can they can come out of poverty and, and enter the middle class, hopefully stay in the city, but if not, uh, go, go not too far to the county and uh, we'll all be better off. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, given the large and diversity, large um, and diverse board, and having served previously, can you speak to what role you played previously when you? Were I played that sort of a role. I I, I was a voice for um, good jobs, sustainable jobs, jobs that that pay a, a wage where you could uh, have a quality a quality life and raise a family. So that's exactly the role that I played, and I remember very distinctly when my at the end of my term saying, you know, it's not just about jobs, it's about sustainable jobs and good mm -hmm. jobs. Was there a particular project that you can speak to relative to your role on this, uh, on this board? Oh, well, uh, I, I was always very active in the, in the uh, discussions. Um, as you may be aware, the United Labor Agency is, is the, runs a one stop, and the, so they have a lot to do with the Workforce Board, Dave Meganhart. Um, attends every meeting, and uh, they work very closely uh, with with that organization, which has also a very stellar record in terms of placement of people into jobs, not sending people from one training program to the next, but actually placing people into jobs that they keep because they're well matched. All right. So I was really a big advocate for that. I'll open it up to my colleagues. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns? from my colleagues. All right, Councilman Miller. Madam Chair and Ms. Applegate, I think your, uh, your perspective is one that's 
that's urgently needed as part of our workforce efforts. I uh, read recently that it has been uh, 10 years now since the federal minimum wage has been increased, the, the longest time in, in our history that we've gone without an increase. And, and the, uh, the level of income inequality in, in this country is, is probably the highest that it's ever been. And, and uh, there, is, uh, there is just an urgent need to uh, do more than just, just find someone a job and get them off unemployment. It, it needs to be... Uh, be a quality job with a living wage and benefits and, and a pathway to future progress. And, and I really appreciate your bringing that perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Miller. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns? All right. Oh, Councilman Jones. I can't say I really have a question, but um, at the heart of it is because we know your work, we know what you, what you represent, and you stated it very clearly. And it is a necessary component of this board. So I look forward to supporting you in this in this uh, vote. Thank you. All right. Any other questions, comments? No? There being none? All right. I think we all echo the sentiments of our two colleagues that have uh, spoke. And um, I thank you for coming out and your willingness to, to serve in this capacity. So I believe um, after we hear from our next two candidates, I, I, we will take a vote and move this to the full body of the council. That is my hope. So um, our next candidate thank up, you. thank you very much. Our next candidate up is Mr. Theodore N. Carter. If you state your name and give us a little bit of your background and why you would like to continue sure. to serve. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, uh, members of the committee, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Theodore Carter, I am the Director of Development, Chief Economic Development and Business Officer for Cuyahoga County. I've been a member of this board for the last three years. And uh, for me, this reappointment is very important. During the uh, Buddhist administration, we've really focused on integrating economic development, workforce development. As you know, uh, workforce, we've created an Office of Workforce Innovation, which is the core of the uh, Office of Development. Um, we have also worked very closely with OMJ, and so as the counties, not only uh, one or two county representatives to this board, I also serve as the point of contact for our OMJ, so it allows me to both be strategic and working with uh, my fellow board members, but also to be the point person for issues that OMJ has uh, with the county. As you know, we're the fiscal agent and oversee the finances of the uh, OMJ and our contribution to that, and so this really has been um, an opportunity to have the two entities complement each other in a way that they haven't, I'd say, over the last 10 years. I'd give two examples. One is uh, by uh, being a member of this board, I've been able to integrate and also a uh, participant in the funders group, which was a collaboration of the city and philanthropic entities across the county to kind of direct and restructure and realign workforce efforts in the uh, county. Uh, we've been able to have OMJ also be a participating member in that effort. And so you'll hear more about that at the Economic Development Committee meeting on Monday, where we've identified three core sectors to focus workforce efforts on, manufacturing, IT, and healthcare. Uh, you'll hear in a minute from uh, Mr. Karp, who is leading the manufacturer uh, sector intermediary. And so that's an important statement to have OMJ contribute um, I think close to half a million dollars in training dollars to support this effort, work called Workforce Connect. Uh, two, working with uh, Mr. Merriman, we've been able to uh, encourage OMJ to collaborate on the TANF RFP for WIOA funding that was recently uh, uh, released. It also gives me another opportunity to hear directly from employers uh, who are members of the board uh, who articulate their concerns and insights around workforce. Uh, so I think about the uh, UH uh, really advocating for us to create a program to place more uh, residents in their uh, nursing programs. And so OMJ has recently accomplished that. And so that is where we've been responsive, working with OMJ to accomplish that. Um, and also the skill up program, which you all are very well familiar with, uh, we've been able to create, and it's still a work in progress, more alignment and collaboration between OMJ's efforts to engage employers and using the skill-up service. 
All right, thank you very much. Um, you touched on uh, quite a few things as it relates to um, the Skill Up program, which is the last thing. And this, for the record, for people who don't know, OMJ is Ohio Means Jobs. Um, do you have, uh, does this, this, this board have uh, goals that they set as far as the number of people that they would like to place um, or would like to see a percentage increase, particularly when you're talking about half a million dollars in the um, Workforce Connect? Are there some set goals that the board has set? Um, those goals are being developed and reestablished because we are in the uh, process of developing our strategic plan for the next several years. That process should be completed by uh, early September, and so as a part of that plan, and so there was an earlier strategic plan that's being revised, uh, those goals will be established with respect to uh, the training dollars that OMJ has allocated for Workforce Connect. Uh, because we're in the process of uh, establishing those sector intermediaries, those goals will be created as well uh, in terms of, but their dollars can only be used for training placement and not uh, infrastructure. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I'll open it up to my colleagues if you have any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Carter, for yes, coming in this morning. I appreciate you thank and you. your willingness to continue to serve in this capacity. Next up is Ethan S. Carp. If you'll step forward, state your name for the record and share with us your background and why you'd like to continue to serve. Absolutely. Ethan Karp, CEO of Magnet, the Manufacturing Advocacy and Growth Network. I would like to, so I think I've been on this board for three years, and I remember being here. I think that was the last time I was in this room, was talking to you all about joining the first time. Since that time, I'm now on the executive committee, and that strategic plan is in the committee that I chair hands. Of course, it's an outside party doing it, so we've been integral in helping really, I, I hope, reshape a little bit of how the board and the organization thinks about that training that Ted talked about that um, makes sure that people get into those higher paying jobs that we were hearing about earlier. I represent manufacturing full on, both in terms of the work that Magnet does, which is helping startups, helping established companies. We go in, we create new products, we help efficiencies, we actually work with the companies inside their companies. And then we have a whole arm doing workforce because that's the most urgent need in the manufacturing sector. And in that capacity, we're helping schools, including CMSD, think about how is manufacturing a good career path, helping them adopt apprenticeship programs from Europe. So we have lots of experience over many years working in workforce. The experience on the board for the last three years has really been able to see, well, how can the public workforce system start to provide those resources like the money they've allocated to Workforce Connect to be able to, uh, I wouldn't say, um, uh, let's say entice people into the careers and using Tri-C for an example, to get the skills that people talk about, the skills gap needing to really go into these higher paying manufacturing careers. And so being on the board has enabled me to be able to not only make sure that manufacturers are best served by that organization, but also help think about how the organization is helping the entire community with this very business mindset uh, going forward. Workforce Connect, which Magnet and Greater Cleveland Partnership was selected to be the workforce intermediary, which I'm very excited to talk to you a bit about next Monday, is uh, the one of its biggest ways to actually affect change in the community is through the Workforce Development Board and OMJ. It's certainly one of the largest resources that exists. And I can tell you today, it's not 100% aligned with necessarily every goal of business, which perhaps it shouldn't be because it's got a very you know, resident facing uh, uh, role to play as well. But the idea that sitting on the board while also leading the sector partnership, which is bringing all these manufacturers together to say what they need from the community, it's a very nice nexus point to make sure that there's direct connectivity between the two. So that's what I'm really looking forward to using that business hat over the next three years to make a difference on the board for the residents of the community and of course for the manufacturers. So. Please ask questions. <laughs> as it as it relates to your your company and the manufacturing industry, mm -hmm. what it what are some of the challenges, the greatest challenges that you faced and face with filling these um, jobs? So so Magnet, we work with hundreds. We're a nonprofit, of course. We work with hundreds of um, manufacturers every year, and the majority of them would say number one issue. We also have data and all this. They they would say the number one issue, and this has been consistent the last few years, is filling their workforce needs at all levels. And it basically separates based on the number of 
employees they have, right? They have equal numbers of entry level to mid-skill level to engineering openings that they're always trying to fill. And given our low unemployment, also given some of the real barriers like transportation that aren't necessarily on the top of mind of the manufacturers who may be on the suburbs, they don't realize where untapped potential is across the city and, and in other parts of the county that they don't have access to today. They just see that they keep getting one small portion of a population that they don't want in their plants, and they're not seeing the wider net that they could be casting. And so we get to see that a little bit more clearly engaging with OMJ, Workforce Development Board, and we get to be able to play that intermediary role to help them see what could be, but it's not just letting them see because you still have real barriers, transportation, training, et cetera, that they have to overcome. And this is the this is the meat of the work of the sector partnership. It's also the meat of the work of the Workforce Development Board, uh, just approaching it in different ways. So I'd say, number one, that's their issue, followed by every other issue that we would deal with. I need a new product. I need to sell into my markets better. I need better efficiencies so my price can come down, all of the other business type things that we help them deal with as well. Uh, but they, they fall distinctly under their desire for, um, for skilled workers. As a side note, their most concerning thing, rising concerning thing of when we talk to them is cybersecurity. So this is, uh, this is a big deal for manufacturers, thinking of how they're going to make sure that their infrastructure and machines and everything is is secure. You don't hear you hear about it in the ether a little bit, but you don't hear manufacturers or businesses talking about it because it's pretty embarrassing when you lose a few million dollars because somebody shut down your computer network and you were ransomed. So this is happening too. So that's their biggest growing concern, uh, and all the technologies that one could use to protect, but also to integrate. You know, uh, all the things on your shop floor. That's also a very big thing on people's mind right now. So. So I'd, I'd like to hone in just on the transportation part mm -hmm. of it because that seems to be a recurring uh, theme as far as challenges and when, when people come before us and filling mm -hmm. uh, job opportunities. So has there been conversations on this board relative to um, public transportation or partnering or integrating or improving those conditions so that these uh, individuals have uh, more resources available to them to get to the jobs that are not necessarily in their community? Can you speak to that? Uh, sure. The conversation has absolutely come up. I would say that the problem is larger, though, than the Workforce Development Board. So if, if I was Grace uh, standing up here, I'm sure I would tell you of all the different ways that they pay for bus passes and use public transportation and even probably have some form of stipend built into certain of their training dollars that could be used. I'm sure these are policies that we've passed recently. They're, they're sticking in my mind to be used for that sort of thing. But the, the fundamental issue of getting somebody out to Solon, uh, which a bus pass wouldn't necessarily solve, is still a problem that it's exciting that the board is cognizant of, right? With those membership, right? They're, they're all representing companies that see those needs, and so they're talking about it. But that's really why you need what the Workforce Funders Group and the county has started in that group and these sector partnerships, because in this sense, the business community working with RTA, working with the Workforce Development Board, you need that sort of level of community solution for this, because uh, th there's all sorts of inherent problems. So just an example. So the Solon, okay, let's put some public buses going to it. That sounds great, except there aren't any employees that would use that bus today. So you'd run an empty bus for a while just until the point where the Solon company said, well, good, now we can start hiring from that region. So you have a huge chicken or an egg problem where they're not there now, but there wouldn't necessarily be there if you created one bus route. You also have this very big challenge of this last mile issue, right? So if you, if you get a thoroughfare, I think of it as thoroughfares. If you got a thoroughfare coming from the city going to Solon, well, that would shorten the route. But Solon itself in the middle of winter is still a pretty large area to traverse. Are the companies going to pay for busing? And these are the types of solutions I know that, for example, the Fund for Economic Future and uh, RTA are looking at all with the business community saying, well, here's what I would need. Here's how I could contribute. They don't want to be in the busing business, but frankly, they're so desperate for people and good people and that, you know, these solutions are on the table if we can think of something at scale. So next Monday, you'll hear less about the transportation, uh, about what the sector partnership of manufacturers want to do, um, although transportation I know is going to come up in the pursuit of all of their strategies uh, that you'll hear about next Monday that they would like to pursue uh, as a group of manufacturers.
through the sector partnership work that you guys are funding. My, my final question would be uh, relative to our um, reentry population. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, are, what are the efforts being made to accommodate those who have uh, felon, felonies on their record? Or has that come up? Or is there conversations around that? There are. I don't know if Ted is more aware of them than I am. So there are, because I know that OMJ has contracts with others and entities to specifically work with that population uh, in all of its efforts. I am not the best qualified to talk about what specifically those are. This is definitely one of the population that comes up on a regular basis, but you have like a towards employment and that OMJ works with and I'm fairly certain funds for certain projects who is very well tuned to that population and is helping them get jobs. I can speak from the manufacturing perspective, which isn't necessarily just the board's perspective here and saying that this is a, um, it's, it's a very emotional issue when you talk to a manufacturer because on the one hand, you have a manufacturer who has hired an ex-felon and says, this is the most loyal employee I've ever had. This is wonderful. You should all do it. And then you go to the next 25-person manufacturer and says, I'm a family. I couldn't possibly consider having an ex-felon in my building, irregardless of the offense. And so we've got to break down that mentality because we know uh, that the population is large. We know that it's a very loyal population of individuals uh, and that we can find them, et cetera. So this is something that I'm hoping the sector partnership individuals there, because we have a wide variety of folks who uh, give these perspectives, that they'll start influencing others to say this is, this is something that's just in your mind and, you know, show them data that this is not the reality of you get crime in your facility when you hire an ex-felon who, you know, fits whatever criteria you want to put on them for type of offense. So, so at the board level, I know that it is something that is actively part of the services of OMJ. I just couldn't tell you more specifically. Well, I respectfully request that we become stronger advocates for the population. We cannot expect uh, citizens to become productive citizens if we don't give them those fair opportunities. I will open it up to my colleagues. Are there any questions there? Councilwoman Conwell was first and then Councilman Jones. Uh, through the chair to Mr. Kerb, uh, you talked about the strategic plan. Do you know when the last strategic plan was? It was five years ago. Okay. And how long will this strategic plan be? It's planned as a five-year strategic plan. Okay. And last question. Does the board keep... Um, track of outcomes from the local programs in terms of work for how many they hire and get hired? Uh, they, they keep track of all of this ad nauseum. Uh, it's, it's a product of the federal funding streams. They can tell you the wages, how many they placed, etc. You also have to consider that there's two buckets of this. There's the bucket of just placement that any one of their services has touched, so helping them resume prep, helping them actually find the job, et cetera. There's then another bucket of training dollars, which you've talked about. And those specifically would take from that same population and then give them extra dollars to go to school, et cetera, and hopefully go into one of these in-demand occupations, healthcare, IT, manufacturing, <coughs> although a lot of them end up as truck drivers today. Uh, and that is a separate, same funding streams, but that's a separate program sort of that they also track is sort of training outcomes as well. And then I know that there's a whole myriad of other programs in partnership with a number of other entities, uh, disabilities, et cetera, that, that are being tracked alongside of that. So yes, all of those outcomes are tracked on a at least quarterly basis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We often talk about the manufacturing out in Solon and the need to get transportation mm -hmm. out there. Um, but there's an opportunity corridor right here in the heart of Cleveland and uh, the biotech industry that's developing around this corridor. Uh, does man Magnet play a role in that manufacturing or is that uh, mm -hmm. that is part of? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's just when we talk about Solon, it's just because it's it's sheer numbers. Okay. Just saying there's a huge number here and biggest bang for my buck in terms of getting more people into jobs and more manufacturers happy with the people they go is that sort of job hub. But our programs, we have folks in core city of Cleveland, you know, Lincoln Electric and Jack Tron's company, right? So they're all over. We just highlight that as a big example. And, but yes. Some of the early resistance to the opportunity corridor was in the community who many thought it was just easy access into that, that downtown, to the, um, that uh, university circle area. Mm -hmm. um, but over the time, uh, we've tried to push, I have and many others have said there are jobs coming 
you know, as these companies. Can you speak to the the uh, workforce efforts that are being done right now uh, for those right there in the neighborhood for the job opportunities that are that are springing up as we speak? So I can cursory talk about this. So from the OMJ perspective, one of the things that our committee did, as we said, um, the Strategic Functions Committee, is we said, look, we most of our services are just blanket, right? Whoever comes and shows up, we help them. And so there are services that go into the libraries, for example. That's one of the outreach. If you show up at a library, there's potentially an OMJ person there, and they can help you with services. The other approach is to say, well, labor force participation in some neighborhoods is very, very low. Could we look at that information and go into a neighborhood? And in this case, one of those neighborhoods was the neighborhoods around Opportunity Corridor. Could we put a person in there and actually start looking at you know, going almost door to door and working in the community and trying to get more of those individuals and jobs. So I know that there's a full-time person and had been anyway, a full-time person for a while working on uh, getting people into jobs from those neighborhoods. I think there's also a cart horse problem here too, in terms of, yes, there are efforts going on to help those individuals get those jobs, but I think it's going to be a longer journey to actually get all of the jobs because companies in the manufacturing sector move maybe once in a generation, you know? So all companies will move at some point, but they, they don't move, like there's not a pent up demand for people ready to move their factories. I'm an advocate for people moving into areas where there's actually workforce. So Solon might have your advantages of, I don't know, land or close to where the ownership lives. But if people are the major issue, opportunity corridor, should be a very attractive place, assuming that there's appropriate uh, remediation and, and ready sites for them. They can go in and say, well, there is a workforce that's right next door, and OMJ would be right there to be able to help them get into that or the sector partnership, et cetera. So that's theoretically how it should work, but I'm not sure how many you know, manufacturing plants are actively recruiting right now an opportunity corridor uh, to be able to focus those efforts on. But... OMJ for general jobs in the region has been focusing on them. Does that answer your question? Did I just uh, did I hear you say they are not actively recruiting? Maybe no, I'm, I'm saying the just... number of manufacturing firms currently located on Opportunity Corridor obviously okay. is not right. there yet. So there's that that's not happening yet, and I'm saying that's going to be a it's going to have a long tail because manufacturing companies aren't all going to just start moving because they don't move that often. Period. Can you speak to the population, that, the the industry that already exists? Uh, when I when I look at Euclid Avenue, mm -hmm. I, I see the companies, their names. I see the nonprofit, Bio Enterprise. I don't know if you partner yeah. with them in any way, but I, I see them there. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to what they have done? I can't. Okay. I can't. I mean, I do know Bio Enterprise is working on uh, has their own workforce initiative. The not the difficulty, the challenge is. It makes it easy for me to talk about manufacturing because in manufacturing, I'm mostly going and I can say. There are plenty of people that don't even need the, 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 the training. There's people that need training, but there's a lot of just entry level companies will train them themselves and invest in them. Uh, and, and they're good paying jobs. They're middle skills jobs very quickly. They have good career trajectories. In some of the more technical fields, IT and um, you know, health IT, which is where bioenterprise is focused, you actually do need some sort of advanced degree or you know, some sort of at least associates to start getting in that. So the plan for that workforce has to be longer term. So one of the things Bioenterprise is doing is going into high schools and trying to their health, uh, health IT pushes to go into the schools and actually get people interested with companies there in future IT careers. So they'll go and they'll go to a Tri-C or they'll go to CSU. They'll then take courses so that they can get into those more um, better paying jobs even than, than the ones I'm talking about, but that require some sort of degree for the IT sector, for health IT sector, like what Explorers will be. I'll say one thing I've been I've said to my constituents at times is we're no longer chasing smokestacks, we're chasing pe petri dishes now. And with all of these innocuous brick buildings and all yeah. of the manufacturing work that's going on inside of them, uh, my ask is that as you uh, desire to be on this board, that... Um, Keep it in mind uh, that those around there, they desire to work. There's a, there's a population, and uh, my hope is that they are trained for the opportunities that are right in their neighborhood that many can walk to. Mm -hmm. That again, that exist on Euclid Avenue that I expect over the years that are going to come, 
and that it, it, it be in the forefront of others' minds that this is not what people thought it was. Uh, and it's what I've been advocating, that it is an opportunity and not easy access. It genuinely is an opportunity. And, and that happens when we help those individuals connect to that work. So I agree. As, as you serve on that board, I hope we can keep that in mind. I, I would also comment that mo- not most. No, most. Most manufacturing, you said Petri dishes. The same could be said about most manufacturing jobs, not all. But you, you go into Jack Tron's company and you would see, uh, you probably have, you, you'd see you know a very wide range of stuff from people operating and controlling robots to putting complex assemblies together, et cetera, et cetera. So Petri dishes, IT, like that's all manufacturing as well. But I'd say the vast majority of jobs are increasingly high tech in manufacturing. Uh, which is why there's an increasing skills gap where they do require skills, although I still think there's a large window where the skill isn't, I need a bachelor's degree. The skill is, I need somebody with a few months of training, maybe. Um, I, I, would, I would encourage you to think that any manufacturer that is going to be competitive in the next five or 10 years is going to be of that ilk. I'm not saying they don't have you know, lower level jobs at all that, that don't require any of that, that aren't great paying jobs, but increasingly they're going to be well paying technology-based jobs. So I, I, I echo your sentiment and say even more manufacturers, regardless of whether they're healthcare, that move in there will be a benefit to the local community, and it makes sense for everyone to hire locally. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Councilman Miller. Madam Chair, Ms. Mr. Carp, what is the workforce doing, if anything, to uh, help people who have mental health and addiction disorders to get treatment and and, uh, and be uh, better qualified to be effective in the workforce. Mr. Miller, I apologize because I cannot answer that question, although I do know we have representatives from those fields, both at OMJ and on the board. I couldn't tell you exactly what the board was doing to address that, so my apologies. I'll just make a comment that uh, there's just a high degree of prevalence, and it's uh, it's a major barrier to uh, getting employment, to getting high quality employment, to keeping high quality employment. So I think it's an important area that the uh, the board needs to be involved in, probably mainly through partnerships, but but it is important. Thank you. Miller, and thank you, Mr. Carp. So I think you've heard the concerns and you've answered uh, several questions relative to uh, the, the board and your willingness and competency uh, <laughs> relative to serving on this, to continuing to serving on this board. So if there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, um, I'll ask Ms. Pomerantz, should this be second reading suspension? Uh, if possible, Madam Chair. All right. Okay, then I'll make the motion to move this to sec- un- under second reading suspension to the full body of the council. Do I have a second? Second. It's been moved and second. If there are no further questions, comments, or concerns, all in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you very much. And um, is there any miscellaneous business from my colleagues? There being none, um, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.